Yo, yo, YouTube, what's up? It's your boy, Sports and Fitness Rants, man. Um, back with another one. It's your boy, Rob. Back with another video for you guys, man. Some more information about 80s and 90s basketball, man, is what I specifically, um, you know, talk about on here. Um, my opinions, my point of views, uh, things I remember watching when they happened. Um, please click the like button and subscribe to my channel, please. Uh, it helps me out. Um, this video is going to be a quick video about uh, some of the differences in uh, NBA uh, previous eras uh, as opposed to, um, or as this pertains to uh, free agency and how, you know, I remember like, you know, back in the day, uh, like the 80s and the 90s, um, you know, I remember like, Teams used to keep like a core group of players together for a significant amount of years, you know, you know, whether it was, you know, two or three or four players or maybe just two players. Um, but it, teams used to have core players like whenever you thought about a certain team, it, it would associate you would be associated with certain players. Right. So like, you know, in the late 80s or, you know, 90s. You know, when when you thought about, you know, a San Antonio Spurs, for example, you automatically thought the Admiral, right? You automatically thought David Robinson. Um, when you when you thought about the Utah Jazz, you know, you immediately thought about, you know, John Stockton and Carl Malone, right? You know, when you thought about the Seattle uh, Supersonics, you would think about, you know, Sean Kemp, Gary Payton, you know. When you thought about, you know, the New York Knicks, you automatically thought Patrick Ewing, right? His, his name was synonymous with New York in, in the 80s and the 90s. You know, when you thought about, you know, even a New Jersey Nets team, you know, back in them days, you know, maybe in the 80s, you would think about like a Buck Williams. You know, maybe later on in the 90s, you would think about someone like a, a Derek Coleman uh, or a Kendall Gill. Uh, <clears throat> You know, you had teams like the Portland Trailblazers, you would think about automatically Clyde Drexler. You know, uh, you had teams, you know, like uh, in the, uh, like the Philadelphia 76ers, you know, now earlier in, in, the, in the Sixers, you know, like I said, until like the early 90s, late uh, 80s, you would think about Charles Barkley, right? Before that, you would think Dr. J. Um, and then... Uh, you know, before Barkley left. But, you know, you would think uh, Phoenix Suns, you know, you would think uh, Kevin Johnson. You know, he was synonymous with the Phoenix Suns, Kevin Johnson, who should be in the Hall of Fame. So what I'm getting at is, you know, back in like, the, like I said, the, the, the 80s and the 90s, you know, obviously, you know, this, if you had teams like the Lakers, you know, obviously Magic Johnson was synonymous with the Lakers in the 80s, even up to the early 90s. Um, but... You know, and you had this team like the Celtics, obviously, you know, you thought Bird, Parrish, McHale, you know, you, you there were certain guys that came to mind and then later in the 90s, for a little while, it was Reggie Lewis there while Bird was, you know, in his twilight years. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, rest in peace, Reggie Lewis, uh, he passed away tragically on the court, um, but he would have been a good one. He would have been the, the replacement for Larry Bird going into the 90s, into the early 2000s. But anyway, what I'm getting at is that, you know, a, you always associated certain teams with certain players because these certain players were on those teams for a significant amount of time, right? When you think about David Robinson, right? He played his whole career on the San Antonio Spurs. We think about a Carl Malone who spent, you know, mo a majority of his career on the Utah Jazz, John Stockton. You know, when you think about the Bulls with Michael Jordan, he spent his, most of his career on the Bulls, you know, with Scottie Pippen, obviously the same thing. Uh, you think the Houston Rockets, you think Hakeem Olajuwon, he spent his, basically his whole career on the Rockets. So you see, like, these big-name players, you know, Patrick Ewing spent basically his whole career on the Knicks. You know, you see these big-name players, Hall of Fame players, they played their whole careers, basically, you know, except for maybe a couple of years at the end of their career on one specific team. But what doesn't get mentioned in a lot of times with these players or in association with these players is the other guys that were there with them, right? The other core group players, man. Um... It's almost like if you think about the Yankees in the 90s, right? They used to call it the core four, 
right? It was Derek Jeter, Mariano Rivera, uh, Andy Pettit, and I believe Jorge Posada, I want to say. I think he was part of the core four. But anyway, they had four players that were in every single championship that they won, right? And they built around those four players, their core four. And in the NBA, around those eras, the 80s and the 90s, you had that going on because free agency, though it was more prevalent than it was in previous generations, it wasn't like it is now where guys basically play two years on a team. If it's not working out, they're gone. You know, back in those days, players would stay on teams. And I'm talking about not just the star players, the other players or complementary players around them. They would stay on teams, you know, four or five years together. So you would have an actual team, quote unquote team, that knew how to play together, that knew where each other was going to be on the court at certain times. So when, when you go and you think about those teams that I just mentioned, you know, and you think about, you know, the San Antonio Spurs, for example, and I mentioned David Robinson. There was other players that were there consistently with him, guys like a Sean Elliott. Sean Elliott was there all those years, um, and he was part of that 99 championship team along with David Robinson. Now, obviously, that, you know, Tim Duncan was on that team. That was later on, but I'm speci speaking specifically for the core guys, the, the, the guys who played together for, for several years. You know, you got a guy like a, like I said, like a Sean Elliott that was on that team because like a, a bunch of years, you know, later on, Avery Johnson, you know, was part of that group that was on that team uh, for a while. Uh, you know, guys like Vinny Del Negro. Um, you know, you just had guys, like I said, uh, e even a, uh, a guy like a, um, what's his name, man? That, that other guy, man. I can't think of his name right now off the top of my head. Um, can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he was another guy on the same team. But anyway... You know, you always had, like I said, you would had at least two, three, four players that were cons that were constants on some of these teams, and then the the team would build around these players. Um, so when you had guys like this, you know, this contributed to the team aspect of it. Guys knew how to play together. Guys knew, you know, where each other were going to be on the court, what to expect. You know, they understood that from playing with each other for for several years, um, which like I said I think made the league stronger as far as like teams. You know. And, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people, you know, they'll use, um, you know, names uh, to try to as if, you know, to downplay something. You know, they'll say things like, oh, you know, this team only had so and so on it. You know, and they'll name, you know, the one Hall of Fame player, let's say, that was on this team, you know, for a certain amount of years or whatever. But meanwhile, they had very good players alongside this Hall of Fame player that maybe are not in the Hall of Fame, but they were really good, solid, all-around, you know, uh, basketball players that contribute to winning, right? That help you win championships, right? You don't just win championships with just star players. You need the quote-unquote other guys. Um, so then you talk about teams like the Utah Jazz with, with Stockton and Malone. You know, you always, like I said, they had mainstays on those teams, uh, especially, in, you know, in the mid to late 90s where they made their, their two uh, finals appearances. But, you know, even before that, like I said, you, you would have, uh, you know, other players alongside uh, Stockton Malone for several seasons. You know, like I said, the guys like, a, like you know, later on, like a Jeff Hornacek, uh, who was a very underrated, scrappy uh, player and defender. Um, you know, he, he was a solid player, a role player uh, for those teams. Um, you know, you had... You know, like I said, these guys, you know, earlier in their in their careers, um, you know, that, you know, that had pieces around them that, like I said, they didn't gel right away. And then that's why sometimes it took a couple of years for some of these teams to finally break through, you know, because, you know, it's, it was very competitive at that time. And some of these teams had to figure out how to play together um, or maybe they were missing, you know, one player, not a star player, but they were missing that one extra, you know, key reserve guy. Uh, to help them get over the hump. So that's what I noticed, you know, like I said, back in those days, teams uh, kept, you know, their cores together for, for longer periods of time. Like I said, where now maybe players will play together for two two or three seasons and then they break it up or, you know, a guy leaves or something like that. You know, back in those days, some of these, these core groups would stay together for four or five seasons, you know, um, sometimes even longer, you know, depending on the success of the franchise and, you know, the, you know, how far along in their careers certain players were. 
you know, you, you look at, for example, the New York Knicks, right? The New York Knicks had Patrick Ewing and Charles Oakley and John Starks. You had that trio together for like five seasons that they played together, I think. I, I believe it was. Um, and they were the core for the Knicks. Now, obviously, you know, uh, Patrick Ewing was the foundation of, of the Knicks in the 90s and the late 80s. But when, I t when you talk about the core group of guys that you built around, Patrick Ewing and Charles Oakley and John Starks, those were the three staples, man. Those were those three guys that were there in all those teams that you think about that used to go against those Bulls in the early 90s, 91, 92, 93, 94. And then later on, you know, 96, 97, um, <clears throat> those players were on those teams, you know. So you, when you think about those kind of things, like I said, they kept those core together and then they would put in pieces around them. Guys like an Anthony Mason, uh, guys like a uh, Xavier McDaniel, guys like a Doc Rivers. Um, but you had those, and even before John Starks, you know, you had a Kiki Vandaway who was with Ewing and Oakley uh, on those late 80s, early 90s Knicks teams for about three or four seasons. Um, you know, you had guys like a, you know, like a Mark Jackson who was on there as a rookie in his first couple of years in the league with Ewing. Um, with Oakley, you know, you had a later on. So, you know, then you can say you go to uh, other teams, you know, look at the Chicago Bulls, for example, that, you know, obviously dominated the 90s or whatever, you know, and they had Pippen and Jordan, which were their two mainstays, right? Their pillars. But when you look at their championship years or even, you know, right before that, you know, you had your core group. So you had Jordan, Pippen, and Horace Grant. That was their core, you know, along with a, a Bill Cartwright, a John Paxson, and a B.J. Armstrong. They had a, a, essentially a core starting five that they kept together for several years. You know, and a lot of people, I feel like that doesn't get mentioned a lot in the, you know, when, whenever people talk about the Chicago Bulls and they bring up, you know, the dynasty and all these things, they really don't mention the continuity that the Chicago Bulls had, which is what made them so great was that they played together for so many years. You know, like I said, that was an advantage uh, that you have when you play against other teams. Your continuity, right? The way you're able to mesh and gel together. Uh, they all knew how to play together and they knew what to expect from each other. And, and, you know, like I said, that helped them be successful. Now, when you look at the their second uh, three-peat of the Bulls, it was a similar situation where you still had Jordan and Pippen, right? So you still had your pillars there. See what I'm saying? The success with the pillars. You still had your two mainstays, but then you brought in other core guys like a Dennis Rodman, a Tony Kukoc, and a Steve Kerr, right? So whereas in the first repeat, you had built around Jordan and Pippen, Horace Grant, Bill Cartwright, John Paxson, B.J. Armstrong, guys like that, you, had this, you did the same thing in the next three. You built around them with a Dennis Rodman, a Tony Kukoc, and a Steve Kerr, similar players, you know? So you kept those cores together. Um... And, and then you see how successful they were. See, now, then you think about a team like the Portland Trailblazers. You know, that I did a video on a couple of days ago, right? A forgotten team of the eight, late 80s, early 90s with their core group of Clyde Drexler, Terry Porter, Jerome Kersey, and Kevin Duckworth. That was their core, core, their core players. You know, those guys played together for several seasons. I don't know, maybe four or five years in a row, maybe, that they played together. They had those, that core team. And they were successful, making three trips to the Western Conference Finals three consecutive years with two trips to the NBA Finals um, in a three-year window. Um, because once again, they understood how to play together, and it took a couple of years, and they kept coming up, right? And eventually, they were breaking through. See, then that was the thing, too. You know, the, a lot of these teams back in the day, they didn't just, you know, stop the quote-unquote... Um, uh, like they didn't stop it, right? Like they, if, if a team wasn't successful, maybe year one, year two, they kept those guys together, right? They didn't just blow it up and be like, oh, we're not going to win. Let's try something different. They would keep their core guys together and then just rearrange the outside pieces, you know, and then try again the next year, right? And then see how it went. Then try again the next year, you know? And that's how teams did it um, as opposed to now where everybody's always trying to trade a, a superstar player on their team to make a wave and then try to get back, you know, either draft picks or, you know, maybe they're tanking to get a number one. You know, you didn't really have a lot of that back in the day, man. You know, uh, it was more, like I said, you would have your, your one or two main players 
and then you would build a core around those guys. And if you were lucky, you had a three or four uh, a core, a player core that you could build around, right? Um, you know, we, we talked about, uh, how about the Seattle Supersonics, for example, right? The Seattle Supersonics, for example, they built around their core of Sean Kemp and Gary Payne, which culminated in them going to the finals in 1996. But they had mainstays around them, guys like a Hersey Hawkins, uh, guys like a Detlef Shrimp, um, guys uh, like, um, what was the other guy's name, man, that was on that team? Uh, Johnny Newman, maybe? But you had guys, like I said, your core, your core players, but you built around Kemp and Payton. You had your two mainstays, and you built around them from the late 80s, early 90s, right? Um, like I said, which culminated them in break, breaking through in 1996. But those were the two mainstay players, and they built you know, their core around those guys. Um, so when you, when you think about that as opposed to now, you know, I feel like the teams were stronger. Like, yeah, you might have better individual talent now. The talent might be there. The skill might be there. But what's lacking is the team concepts, the team play. I feel like the teams were better in the 80s and the 90s just overall from top to bottom because you had that continuity. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, from, you know, the greater, the, the, the teams there are greater than the teams now. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the team concepts, right, and the way that the teams play together was better, right? Because like I said, they stayed together for s several amount of years. It wasn't a bunch of, you know, moving pieces all the time. A lot of these teams were together for, like I said, three or four seasons in a row. And if they moved a couple of pieces, it was the outside pieces, but the main cores always stayed together, right? You didn't see David Robinson getting traded to another team. You didn't see Carl Malone getting traded to another team or Stockton or Jordan or Pippen, you know, or Sean Kemp or Gary Payton or, you know, Magic Johnson or Larry Bird. Or you didn't see, you know, like I said, you didn't see a lot of these big name guys, you know, getting traded to other teams or leaving in free agency and going to team up with another player. Right, you look at the Detroit Pistons. Right, their core, their core was together for a significant amount of years, right, which kept them competitive in that that East. That was tough, man. You know, your Isaiah Thomas, your Joe Dumars, your Dennis Rodman, your Bill Lane Beers. You know, your 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 um uh, uh what was his name um, Edwards, uh, John Sallies of the world. You know, these guys were on these Pistons teams four or five years together. You know, like I said, which ultimately made them a very difficult team to beat, a team to beat, right? Which was why they were able to dismantle the Bulls for a couple of years there and when Jordan was, you know, by himself, kind of like the Pistons. He had to beat an entire team, a solid team that was obviously well coached also. So, you know, I just wanted to do this video about that, you know, talking about some of the aspects that I've noticed about, you know, basketball, you know, back then as far as how teams stayed together, they kept their core players together. Whereas of now, you know, in, in this era, a lot of times, you know, players don't stay. They, they go on free agency or they get traded. You know, teams are quicker to blow up things now uh, and, and trade their cores or rearrange some of their core pieces instead of keeping their cores together and trying to build around certain players. Um, it's harder to do that now. So I feel like the team aspects of basketball was a lot greater back then. Um, like I said, not saying that the individual talent of players was better. It's talking about just the teams, how teams operated, how they played together. Um, was what I thought was more was more uh, synergy there. All right, so thanks guys for watching my video. I know it's a little long. Sports and fitness rams. Click the like button, subscribe, and you guys be good, man.